I'm Peter Yassi, and I, I wanted to, to thank you all very, very much for, for joining us for the fourth annual Finnegan Distinguished Lecture in Intellectual Property. I see students and graduates and, and colleagues from local schools and members of the Intellectual Property Bar and friends from from the Copyright Office here tonight. It's a wonderful occasion for, for an in-gathering of, of those of us here in the school and in the Washington area who, who care about this subject and its future. And we have a, a significant speaker for you tonight. But, but before I introduce him, I'd like to call on the dean of the law school, who's a great friend and supporter of the program on information justice and intellectual property, which is the, the in-house sponsor of this event and of IP activities at the Washington College of Law generally. So Claudio Grossman. Thank you, Professor Jesse, for the invitation. Uh, to come here and uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, on behalf of American University Washington College of Law to the fourth annual Finnegan Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property. Before uh, we begin, I want to thank uh, everyone whose hard work has made this event possible. Of course, the Finnegan Law Firm and its representative here tonight, David Kelly, chair of the firm's trademark and copyright practice group. You know, the, in the past, uh, law schools will be the only ones doing uh, training and uh, doing research, storing the result of their research in libraries. But the uh, phenomena like the internet and other technologies has uh, contributed to uh, the breakdown of barriers that traditionally has existed in society. And then as part of uh, the strategic uh, vision and mission of this law school is to develop partnership and strategic partnership with others that have this tremendous reserve of talent and knowledge and together with them uh, contribute uh, to the fulfilling of, uh, of uh, our mission, uh, a mission that so well is represented by uh, PG. And then, uh, Again, uh, firms like Finnegan are very important uh, to uh, fulfill uh, the goals uh, in terms of education and service and research that in the past were like established uh, like uh, separate segments uh, uh, in between organizations that would not have a fluid and a permanent uh, connection. So we're proud to have here the firm and look forward to a continuous and creative relationship. The, I want to thank also and recognize, of course, the law school's program on information, justice, and intellectual property, including Professor Christine Hekfaldi, co-director of PGIP, and one of our associate deans for faculty and academic affairs. Christine was essential in the development of this lecture, and her enthusiasm and knowledge certainly has contributed greatly to these endeavors as well as to the development of the law school as a whole. Uh, our esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Peter Yassi, who uh, is uh, the co-director of PG and director of the Glasgow Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic, and he is the reason why we developed this program. He's, uh, he had the vision and, uh, uh, and the concepts that will establish a very definitive uh, message and contribution that this program will fulfill in the dialogue that takes place in the society and in the work concerning intellectual pro uh, uh, property and information and justice. So I thank uh, Peter for his uh, leadership in, in this area. P PG Associate Director Sean Flynn, that since the beginning has been a very creative and powerful force uh, in the intellectual life of the institution and as well organizationally uh, moving ahead the, the program as well as Steve Roberts who works both with PG and our IP clinic. And our Office of Special Events and Continuing Legal Education for this superb organization of this important event. 
you know, this is perhaps not the moment to talk about this, but you should know that we host here in this law school over 80 events uh, addressing issues of our time, representing the vision of the institution uh, and a need to create a space uh, where different ideas are ventilated. There are hardly places in the society where we can address these issues, and it's the role of universities to fulfill that important mission. It's uh, very important also to know that there is hardly an issue that lacks a legal dimension, and then these uh, presentations and conferences are not only important uh, for the those who specialize on a topic, but they bring closer to the public at large fundamental issues that are crucial for their life and development. Now, our law school is very proud to host this lecture, and we look forward to hearing from our distinguished speaker, Daniel Gervais, the world's foremost expert on intellectual property and the law of the World Trade Organization. We are a school with a long record of engagement with international law in all its dimensions. And with today's lecture, we recognize the convergence between international law and the field of intellectual property, another area to which our law school has, has a long-standing commitment. At our law school, we also recognize that IP and trade issues are increasingly intertwined with fundamental notions of fairness and social justice. These values include access to information, access to medicine, and free expression, which affect basic notions of human rights. So we look forward to this important lecture, and uh, that we're sure will contribute greatly to our own development and to address the uh, fundamental issues facing all of us. Our community dedication to promoting IP is reflected also in our wide variety of IP-related initiatives, which includes PGIP, which promotes an approach to IP law that centers on the public interest through scholarship and advocacy. PG promotes social justice in a wide variety of IP-related areas, including fair use and access issues, pharmaceuticals and access to medicine, indigenous IP rights and IP and gender, just to name a few. PG has proven to be an extremely dynamic program that we are very proud of. In just its third years of operation, it has already attracted the attention and support of major funders, including the Open Society Institute and the Ford Foundation, and is, growing, is working with a growing network of information justice advocates around the country and the world to ensure that information is used to promote, not inhibit, human development and fulfillment. Our Glasgow Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic, which was one of the first IP-oriented clinic, clinical programs in the country, now is in its eighth year, and the clinic concentrates on client representation that helps student attorneys better understand the concept of public interest in copyright, patent, trademark, and related issues. Also, education is about motivation, and I will tell you that when I talk to students, of course, they mentioned the superb work done by doctrinal and theoretical courses, but never missed the experiences and the experiential learning they have acquired in our clinics that are essential for the development as lawyers, as human beings, and relate the theoretical and doctrinal issues with very specific topics and they see their historical relevance and dimension. We offer in the school also two LLM specialization in IP through our programs on law and government and international legal studies. Interested students select courses from extensive curricular offering and obtain their LLM degree with an IP specialization focusing either on IP regulation in the U.S. or on global policy and legal issues surrounding IP. The graduates from this program are creating also a community that develops a common narrative and would you see them serving in different capacities in the private sector or advising the governments from different countries in the world in the development of important principles related to IP. Through the IP offerings and others, our students acquire essential knowledge, skills, and practical experience, preparing them to become effective advocates and to tackle key issues in this dynamic area of the law. 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you David Kelly of Finnegan, Chair of the firm's Trademark and Copyright Practice. He has been recognized by numerous organizations as a top trademark and copyright attorney in the country, including as one of the top 10 trademark attorneys in DC by the Legal Times this year. But I would suggest, and I hope that he would agree, that his most impressive accomplishment in his many years of teaching here at UCL is that he's a member of our agent faculty. I have a complaint to make. The students are very assertive, and I've never heard the complaint about you, which says something, but quite to the contrary. When we see this agent faculty, they remind us that there are people out there that can do a better job than the job we do here. So without further ado, please welcome uh, please join me in welcoming David Kelly. Thank you. I always feel so inadequate following Dean Grossman and his eloquent and informative uh, talks. The only thing I could promise to do is be much shorter. Uh, uh, Finnegan's very excited once again to uh, host uh, and sponsor the uh, Distinguished Series on uh, Lectures in IP. Uh, and we're very excited for you know, a number of reasons. One, uh, the law school that we're associated with is a, a great school. Uh, and it's uh, very exciting to have a school that has such a focus on IP. Uh, Dean mentioned the clinic. Uh, I actually referred one of the first uh, litigations to the clinic many years ago. Professor Yazi will remember that. Uh, it was one of those uh, situations where a client calls you up and says, you know, this is the craziest thing you've ever heard in your life. I've got to find somebody else to take this case. It was some disenfranchised members of some uh, very uh, unique church. And the clinic uh, took over the case, turned it around, and I think actually got some damages and attorney's fees. And so uh, it was a very good thing to uh, refer to the clinic. So now they can't turn me down on anything I try and send them. Uh, also, uh, very excited and honored to be associated because of the quality of the attorneys that uh, the law school turns out here. Uh, our firm has hired uh, a number of them across all aspects of our IP practice. Uh, three of our trademark lawyers, the brown nosers in the first row there, uh, are graduates of WCL. And, and finally, we're, we're very excited to be part of this because of the quality of the speakers that Professor Yazi and uh, Professor Farley have been able to secure. We've had Judge Kaczynski and Professor McCarthy, and this year is no exception with Professor Gervais. Uh, I don't know a whole lot of, about TRIPS, but I'm looking forward to learning a lot more, and uh, thanks. So I want to complete introductions. There, there are a few more members of the, the PIDGIP team who I, I want to acknowledge. Uh, Josh, where is, where is Josh Sarnoff uh, from, the, from the, the IP clinic? And two wonderful visitors who are with us this year, uh, Wendy Seltzer and Mike Carroll. There's Mike, great. And, and now it is a, a, a tremendous pleasure to introduce our, our speaker and our friend, Daniel Gervais, who recently took up his new duties as professor of law at Vanderbilt University. Selfishly, we're delighted that he's chosen to move stateside from our Canadian sister law school at the University of Ottawa, where many of us first got to know Daniel in his many capacities as professor, administrator, sometime acting dean. But I knew Daniel at, at least uh, from his work from well before that. I first became aware of that work in 2002 when his remarkable article on the international implications of the U.S. Supreme Court's Feist decisions won the, the prize Chuck Seaton Award of the Copyright Society of the United States of America, an organization with which I have a long connection. That was very shortly after Daniel having distinguished himself as a practitioner and as an international civil servant with time at both WTO and WIPO settled down to pursue what has very quickly developed into a remarkable academic career. Educated in Canada, France, and Switzerland, Daniel is grounded in both common law and civil law 
traditions of intellectual property, and this has given him a platform from which to exercise his special gift of insight into comparative copyright law and to establish himself as a leading authority on global trends in areas such as the law of collective administration, the protectual factual, protection of factual compilations, and of course copyright limitations and exceptions. Also non-trivially, he is a leading authority and commentator on developments in Canadian copyright law. Tonight, however, we welcome Daniel in another intellectual capacity as the preeminent authority, literally the man who wrote the book, and I understand that the third edition is forthcoming shortly, on the TRIPS agreement, the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property. For non-specialists, TRIPS is a uh, text, an accord that formed part of the 1994 WTO agreement and which has emerged in this moment of legal globalization as the leading international source of new norms for domestic IP protection. As you're about to hear, this important legal text is in a moment of transition. And there's no one better qualified to speak with us about its future than Daniel Gervais. Now that Daniel is working just down the road, albeit a somewhat long road, we hope to see him much more often at WCL. But it's a special pleasure and a real honor to be able to greet him in style this evening to discuss a crucial topic at a critical moment in a lecture entitled TRIPS 3.0. Daniel. Well, thank you, Peter. Those were very, very kind words. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you uh, also to D Dean, who's still back there, um, to the sponsor, Finnegan. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, uh, it is indeed a great honor to, to be here, and if I can get screen going here so that I can see what you see. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I don't actually see, so is there a techie in the room who can? <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's a great honor to, to be here uh, also because I know I'm following in um, the footsteps of uh, very important names in the field of intellectual property. Uh, now, many of you, uh, per or perhaps some of you, know uh, my book about TRIPS, which uh, is really an attempt to call it the way it is. Um, but obviously, if I do that in my speech now, uh, by 625, everybody will be asleep. Uh, so what I've decided to do is actually uh, enter the minefield of political economy. Uh, and I just want to, oh, there you go. I had to touch it. Huh? Hmm. Okay. I don't have an iPhone yet. I'm just not used. I'm still used to keyboards. Um, and so uh, to, to enter the field of uh, political economy, mostly looking at what's going on with the TRIPS agreement at the international level, uh, but also obviously uh, in the United States. Um, so the canvas of my talk is uh, the TRIPS agreement uh, for a number of reasons. One is that it uh, has become a very powerful symbol of the globalization of intellectual property. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, uh, the talk will have uh, three parts. Uh, first, I want to describe the incredibly fast evolution of the TRIPS agreement uh, and the understanding that it has generated of uh, international IP, the impact of IP over the past 14 years. The TRIPS agreement is in those difficult teenage years. Um, and so I will, that will be part one. Part two uh, will be a slightly more analytical part. Uh, I want to discuss what it means to regulate IP as a trade-related uh, right. And uh, I will argue that this has some uh, profound impacts, uh, especially on countries that are adopting IP for the very first time. And finally, by about 8.30 tomorrow morning, I'll be discussing uh, the third part, uh, <laughs> lessons and predictions about the future uh, of IP policy. Uh, so here goes. 
Uh, Peter very kindly uh, described uh, TRIPS already, but for those of you who are uh, not entirely familiar with this agreement, uh, it is the WTO agreement uh, on IP. Uh, it's important for several reasons. First, it's the um, uh, first multilateral agreement that covers all intellectual property rights. So copyrights, patents, trademarks, designs, GIs, undisclosed information, and even uh, computer chips. Uh, it's the first multilateral agreement that contains provisions on the domestic enforcement of IP. Therefore, it tells countries what their courts and their border enforcement authorities uh, should do uh, or should have the power to do uh, when IP rights are violated. It's the first multilateral agreement that has binding dispute settlement uh, for disputes between states when they disagree about uh, whether the agreement was in fact implemented, and I'll have a chance to mention uh, one of those disputes a little later on. TRIPS is also an, the first agreement at the international level to link trade and IP. Uh, and as we will see, I really think this had profound impacts on how IP is protected. <coughs> The movement to link the two started right here in the U.S. in the 1980s over several amendments to the Trade Act, which allowed the uh, USTR to, uh, first of all, review what other countries are, are doing, whether they're protecting U.S. IP rights adequately, uh, and you're probably familiar with those reports, but also to uh, suggest or adopt trade sanctions uh, for the failure to protect those rights. Now, this worked to a certain degree, but what TRIPS really did was to internationalize that link uh, between uh, trade and IP. And this happened uh, because for the first time ever, so a lot of firsts in this agreement, uh, and three very powerful industrial groups, pharmaceutical companies, entertainment companies, and software companies got together and basically came to the governments in, in the US, the EU, and Japan with a single agenda um, with some differences, but still essentially the same uh, overall agenda, to have a full IP agreement as a trade agreement uh, in the new WTO. And this agreement was written essentially around 1989, and so it's a photograph of what the West, if I can include Japan in there, uh, could agree on at that time. So the highest level of norms that the Western countries, the demandeur countries, could agree on uh, as of 1989. Now, I will uh, suggest that TRIPS has gone uh, through three phases already in its young uh, life. Uh, the first, which began probably around 1989 and lasted until a few years after the entry into force of TRIPS in uh, 95, was what I call the addition narrative. And this was really fairly simple. Add IP. To the, to the laws of a country that doesn't have them, and something good will happen. Uh, why? Well, uh, because it's, first of all, the right thing to do to protect property against piracy. Uh, because, and this might sound a little more cynical, but I still think this was part of the objective at the time, developing economies need to become consumers of IP sensitive or IP intensive uh, goods and services. Because companies that were lobbying for TRIPS wanted to be able to outsource to countries, but you can, can only outsource IP-sensitive goods or IP-intensive goods to countries that protect IP adequately. And finally, at least for some of the players, the idea was to get, uh, I call this castor oil, I don't know if you're familiar with this horrible tasting medicine that's supposed to cure everything, right? Well, there was a little bit of that. You know, drink this, it's going to be awful, there will be, you know, welfare costs, etc. but something good will happen. And uh, this was a truly, you know, fairly widely held uh, belief. TRIPS was also unique in the way it was negotiated. Uh, there were significant information, uh, information asymmetries between the uh, demandeur countries, essentially EU, the US, and Japan on, on the one hand, with Australia, Switzerland, and so on, uh, following in their footsteps. On, so that's the one, first group, and the developing world uh, on the other. Uh, very few developing countries had deep knowledge of uh, the existing IP agreements. There was some coercion. Uh, I think that's correct, but I think that's, this may have been overemphasized. What's more important, in my view, is that IP was negotiated across sectors. 
will trade you IP for bananas or textiles, which actually we'll see later on actually it had some um, significant impacts on the weight and the power uh, that IP rules have in the WTO. It's evidence that you can trade IP for other things. Uh, and again, that was a first. Then we move to, if I can move this. No, it seems to be stuck. I'm sorry to need help again, but okay, I got it. The third mouse, okay, very good. Um, this is actually good. I can move with this one, so okay. Um, then I think there was a turning point, and I call this the subtraction narrative to really make it clear that the focus changed almost 180 degrees. And this is when the issue of patents, essentially on HIV drugs and malaria drugs, um, emerged in Africa, in Brazil, and other parts of the world. And initially, I think it, it, it's fairly um, uh, clear that the pharmaceutical industry did not play those cards well. Uh, they decided to wage war against two Nobel Peace Prize winners, Nelson Mandela and Doctors Without Borders. Hard to win that battle. Um, but, and it's, it, you know, it, I think it, it actually changed their minds about a number of things. And certainly, uh, for example, Mr. Garnier, the head of GlaxoSmithKline, uh, said last year, we made a mistake then, and we've changed the way that we do things. But for our purposes, what's important in phase two is we went from the benefits of having IP to the analysis of the cost and the negative side of introducing IP in developing countries. So the focus shift to this is about rent extraction from the rich countries. And where's the money going? Shouldn't you have an obligation when you extract money from our economy to invest in diseases that matter in our countries? Those kind of questions. That's really very much TRIPS 2.0, and it's what led to the adoption of uh, the Doha Declaration on Public Health, Article 31 BIS, uh, and all the analytical work done by the organizations that you can see on the screen. At about the same time, empirical data started to emerge. The World Bank in particular was pr producing studies on IP specific to developing nations. Uh, and obviously, if you're doing political economy, empirical data is not something you'll you know, sneeze at. And so the question was, well, can we treat IP the same way in a developing country as it, we did in the past uh, in the West? And the answer is, well, not quite. Uh, and in some cases, not at all. Uh, and uh, we went to analysis, analyses of you know, rent extraction, but also developing local innovation in those countries. And the bottom line of those studies is they showed two things. First of all, there is a multiple and differentiated reality out there. It, to use the biodiversity argument, countries are different. Regions are different. We need to recognize that when we push IP. Second, IP is not magic. It's not woo-woo. You don't adopt IP laws and then, boom, you know, something magical happens. Something much more is needed. You're going to have to do more than just comply with TRIPS if you want to actually benefit uh, from TRIPS at some point. I kind of lost the screen again, but oh, I have to push. All right. And so then we move to TRIPS 3.0. That's where we are today, and I call this a calibration narrative. We move between extremes, as is so often the case, to get to somewhere in the middle, and it allowed us to clear some confusion about what TRIPS is supposed to do. Uh, initially, people said, well, IP is good because it's going to lead to foreign direct investment. Fine. But does that mean innovation? Is that the same thing? There was this confusion that, well, one must be the same as the other, where, in fact, except for China, which always seems to be a bit of a special case, um, and I, you know, I'll come back to that in a second, but IP actually is a precursor to you know, foreign direct investment coming in. You must have good IP for that to happen, but it doesn't mean you'll get innovation. Innovation needs more uh, than just foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment is not in itself an innovation strategy. It's a way to develop you know, certain aspe aspects of the economy. We also know from TRIPS 2.0 and um, the calibration exercises that for certain countries, there's really no point trying to do anything with IP. And these are countries below a certain threshold. And the WTO actually recognized that by excluding the least developed countries from TRIPS obligations uh, for several uh, more years. 
But again, we learned from the first two phases of TRIPS that the, the, this thing we call IP is actually many different things. We kind of know this intuitively, but if you're a country that's complying with TRIPS for the first time, you're told, well, here's a whole bunch of model laws, adopt this, which is what a lot of these countries did, then you realize that's not the way to go. Uh, first of all, you can't deal with all the products the same way because they're protected by IP. Uh, there are some different normative concerns when you deal with educational book, for example, versus the latest Hollywood film. When you deal with HIV treatment versus, say, a lifestyle drug, there are differences among the types of users. You can't deal necessarily, at least, with a consumer, a professional pirate, or a health provider the same way. There are certain arguments and analyses that need to be uh, made differently. Perhaps you get to the same result. But you need to look at things uh, a little bit differently. Finally, and this is a transition to the second part, can you look at IP as a trade, right? Because that's what it has become in the World Trade Organization, to accommodate the distinctions that need to be made between countries, between use, types of users, uh, and um, types of products. So we get to part two. And Essentially, I want to start by discussing what IP as a trade right means when you're um, providing exceptions to IP rights. I, exceptions to IP in, pre, in conventions that predate TRIPS were fairly specific exemptions. You can make an exception for this or that purpose. But there was this weird little exception that was introduced in the Berne Convention, the Copyright Convention, in 1967 called the three-step test. And this was a kind of, I won't say corner of a napkin, but almost a political compromise because countries said, well, there's this new, new right, actually, believe it or not, the right of reproduction, the basic right, made it to the Berne, into the Berne Convention only at the last revision in 67. Um, they said, well, some countries will want to make exceptions to this right. We can't agree. Some wanted private copying. Some want, Let's put these three steps very kind of fuzzy, and you know, that'll be fine. The problem with fuzzy is trade negotiators love fuzzy. And so if you open the door to fuzzy, they're going to say, well, let's put that everywhere in TRIPS. And they did. So that these three steps are actually now the filter for pretty much all acceptable exceptions under TRIPS. What are the three steps? Well, first, the exception must be a special case. OK. Uh, two panels have told us that means it should be limited in scope. There are very few unlimited exceptions, you know, short of, of abolishing the act that I can think of. Second step, it must not unreasonably conflict with normal exploitation of the right. Well, that, that's interesting. How do you interpret that? And the two panels said, when you lose money, when you lose the ability to exploit a market that is real or that is potential, but de demonstrably potential, that you're going to, that, that will be negatively affected. Third, the exception, these are cumulative steps, must not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the owner. Now, you could do a doctoral thesis on pretty much every word in that sentence, but the two panels have, a, again, they don't agree fully on what this one means, but they agree essentially on this. You must have a public interest justification for the exception. Seems pretty logical. But also, how do you determine what's an unreasonable prejudice you look at lost revenue. Well, this is quite important. What it means is you now have a staunchly utilitarian test that is the overarching filter for all exceptions. And the main impact uh, really is to say, this is not property we're talking about. This is trade. It's about dollars. What's your prejudice? Show me you lost money, and I will recognize your right. That's not the song we're used to here. That's certainly not the song the music industry or farmer or all the rights holder groups are singing. This is property. If you trespass on my land, I don't have to tell the judge, oh, well, I have this great evidence of damage to my property. No. You're on my land. Get out, right? We're not there at all here. Uh, we're really saying there should be evidence that the piracy not only is present, but in fact is disrupting the market. 
Now, this was kind of theoretical, and I've written about this in my book as a kind of, yeah, this is theoretically possible. Well, last week, in a report that's still confidential, it's leaked all everywhere on the internet, but highly confidential, uh, there's a report in the case between the U.S. and China um, that came out, and one of the things, the U.S. won on a number of technical points, but it didn't win on one of the points. It was trying to get the panel, at least at the interim version of the report, it was trying to get the panel to agree that the, the, the certain thresholds in Chinese law that say you can't be prosecuted for criminal, uh, can't be criminally prosecuted for making less than, say, 500 copies of a copyrighted work was in itself, as a matter of definition, a violation of TRIPS because TRIPS said you must provide criminal sanctions for piracy on a commercial scale. And the panel, again, this is an interim report and it may change, but as it stands now, it seems to say, show me the money. Where's the evidence? We're not going to take a definitional approach here. We're going to say, show me the dollars. Show me that this is actually really commercial scale. Trade people are used to that. They like anti-dumping cases. They want to see the dollars. The same thing here. The problem is this is not the way we think of IP. We don't think of IP, no damage, that you can actually bring evidence, uh, you know, up, no right. We don't actually think about the, so this actually means that thinking about IP as trade related and asking the WTO to enforce it may in fact change the nature of the right itself. And again, this was a kind of theoretical possibility up until two weeks ago. Now that I've, I haven't, no, I haven't read, I'm not allowed to, uh, that I've heard about this <laughs> panel report, um, you kind of wonder, you kind of wonder. Now, this was the exceptions as in TRIPS. Now I want to focus on something else that is happening because we put IP to WTO. And this isn't a debate about fair use or exceptions to copyright or patents or trademarks. It's about IP having to get into the ring and fight other rights. That's also possible because IP is now one of 22 agreements in the WTO. All IP rights are equal, and as Peter said, I, I do a lot of copyright law, and copyright used to be special. It still is in our hearts, right? But the fact is that the WTO, no. It's one of, you know, one of the few rights that, uh, it's one of the many rights, rather, that's, that's protected by the agreement. And so what happens when you, when you do that? Well. Not necessarily a lot, but a lot can happen. So this is my next theoretical kind of concern. This one hasn't been proven right or wrong yet, but I just want to mention it. The WTO appellate body, which is the ultimate step in the dispute settlement mechanism, has said you cannot read TRIPS or other WTO agreements for that matter in clinical isolation from international law. What does that mean? Well, it means, in theory at least, and this is the way that the appellate, the appellate body seems to mean when you read the decisions, that you can actually import non-WTO rights and use them to interpret WTO agreements. For example, can you bring human rights? The panel, not the panel, the appellate body has done it, has done it twice already. They've, yep, I've lost my screen, okay. The appellate body's done it twice already to look at, for example, the European, European Convention on Human Rights uh, in interpreting certain WTO agreements. This may be good news if you're a rights holder because, for example, copyright creators' rights are protected in three Im important international instruments. But so is access to culture and knowledge, also protected as human rights. So will the WTO become the arbiter of these two human rights? If you look at patents from a human rights lens, well, then they become part of a very broad framework about, in certain cases at least, life and death. They're not commodities. How do you bring that in a trade agreement? How do you reconcile trade with these notions? Well, the appellate bodies doesn't seem shy here to at least attempt that. But I want to say, obviously, in this talk, a lot more about developing countries and their role in innovation. And one of the things that has huge normative heft in developing countries is traditional knowledge. Many developing countries are rich in traditional knowledge. And they say, you know what? We actually have rights in traditional knowledge. And I want to oppose my deck of cards to your trade deck of cards. 
one of the, these cards or many of these cards being IP. There are four instruments that I, are listed here. I could have listed more, uh, but for example, uh, the general comment of uh, the interna inter International Covenant on Economic, Social, anyway, I'll get there, uh, clearly establishes rights uh, that apply to states that are, can also be members of the, the, the WTO. States, for example, should adopt measures to ensure effective protection of the interests of indigenous peoples. So what developing countries are saying is, well, I can't do this if I am forced to implement trips this or that way. That may not be right, but it's certainly that the incompatibility itself may not have been proven, but the argument can be made. And what, what if you do, that if, you, if you try that before the appellate body? I'm not sure what the answer would be. Some agreements actually go one step further. The very recent declaration on the rights of indigenous people um, says indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, and protect. And go to the bottom, if you can read it, they have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property over such cultural heritage. That's clearly relevant. It doesn't mean the appellate body might, would be bound by this, but they could certainly look at it. So we're dealing here with a calibration effort of the TRIPS agreement that goes well beyond what we thought TRIPS would be about, which was mis initially amending IP laws all over the world to make them more or less the same, to give a certain comfort level to the companies that export a lot of IP. Well, we've moved in the last 14 years very quickly beyond that. Developing countries are saying, I need a lot more than norm implants. I need national innovation, and that will be achieved because I will have a strategy to get there. They keep reminding at, at WIPO and other, play, in other fora, uh, keep reminding their partners, their trade partners, trading partners, that IP is just one of the many rights that is relevant here. And ag again, they're right, and the appellate body has been at least open to the thought, to the idea of <laughs> playing a role, and I'll, I'll end uh, my talk about saying what the, I think the WTO might do. So that negotiators in international IP discussions, certainly at the multilateral level, at the bilateral level it's different, but the multilateral level, they want those normative concerns broader than just protecting IP uh, recognized. Let me just give you one example of how that might work. If you're India and you are trying to implement patents on pharmaceuticals, you have a dilemma. Your population clearly says, I want you know, essential drugs at a price I can pay. Don't we all? But they're very rich in Ayurvedic and other types of traditional medicines, which they want to protect. And they, there's a great market for that, not just in India. So what do they do? Well, they had to make a choice here. I can adopt high non-obviousness or utility even standards uh, and or novelty or, you know, the general patentability standards. And if I do that, I'm going to exclude some Western pharmaceuticals, and they, they have, from patentability. But if you do that, you're hurting your traditional medicine industry. So this is, these are very difficult choices. Um, at the WHO, so internationally, this was discussed, and uh, the solutions, if I can call them that, that have emerged um, in discussions last year and earlier this year uh, are fairly obvious in a way, although they took a while to, to get there. Uh, they say basically you have to look at the, having proper patentability standards. Well, okay, what are they? Uh, secondly, there needs to be a new balance, a new equilibrium between privately funded and privately, uh, pri publicly and privately funded medical research. Um, this was actually adopted 193 to 1. I'll let you guess which country voted uh, against. So if you're India, this is only one of the many equations that you need to find a solution to in not implementing TRIPS mechanically so as to avoid disputes, but in trying to implement TRIPS as part of a national innovation strategy. It's incredibly complex, and if the country is as big as India or China, obviously the level of complexity is compounded. So very quickly, how do these countries develop this kind of strategy? And this is really just a shopping list of things they can think about. Uh, but the first thing they'll realize is TRIPS doesn't say anything about this. So you're going to have to look somewhere else. So one place they've been looking is, is WIPO. And I'll come back to the WIPO's role. 
Uh, and this is important because what they're trying to look at or look, um, uh, well, th what they're looking at WIPO for is some way to fill this kind of magical gap between having IP laws and innovation, the black box in between. What do you need to do to get from A to B? Some of them, like Brazil, have been also very uh, adamant about limiting welfare costs of, of implementing certain IP rights. But the things that emerge in discussions, again, no big surprises here, education. But one of the interesting uh, uh, innovations in education, if I can put it this way, is teach software. Why? What do you need to innovate in software? A mind and a PC. That's really it. No big investment. You need training, you need education, yes. But once you have that, there's no big lab to set up. All you need is a mind, a good mind, and, and a PC. And you can innovate in both art and science with a computer, which is also very interesting. Countries also need incubation policies. Uh, you can't just start these new companies or at least expect them to emerge like mushrooms. They may, but what if you help them a little bit? Patent information systems, subsidies, awards, uh, et cetera. These are all things that TRIPS never, ever mentions. But that if you, as a developing country, say, I want to play this game too, uh, that you're going to need. In the meantime, in the West, we're recalibrating IP. We're looking at some problems with patent law. Um, the Supreme Court has made an effort, uh, like it or not, to uh, uh, tell us about a few things in patent law. Um, the Europeans are still debating software patents and business method patents. Uh, we're still you know, discussing dilution and the DMCA, and although the DMCA is less of a hot topic, it's still. Uh, so we're actually looking at recalibration. Even this liberal left-wing propaganda publication <laughs> says there are issues with patents. There are issues because they, certain forms of patents um, may actually suppress innovation, and this is the debate about you know, trolls and so on. So the calibration effort is different in countries that already have a TRIPS-compatible IP structure, but it needs to go on as well, and it is, in fact, uh, going on as well. Part three is, therefore, how do you put this together and look at the future of innovation? And I'm going to make a few points that uh, are slightly controversial. So the pictures were taken before so that tomato <laughs> stains won't be a problem. And I want to look at the impact that developing countries have on innovation, at least those countries that actually have an innovation strategy. And then I want to look at lessons that both developed and developing countries um, can draw from these developments. Let's question the assumptions here. And this is one of the incredible things that has happened over a very, very small number of years, the last 14 years. One is somebody said, well, what's the role of the state in innovation? What are we taking for granted that the state can or cannot do? The WTO is, after all, an intergovernmental organization. Are we assuming here that the state has this kind of pastoral role, that this role to promote innovation from the ground up or from the top down, depending how you want to look at it, a role in education about innovation, about economic development? This sounds very simple to all of us because we're used to, have, you know, to having a certain relationship with the state if you're working in innovation, but it involves, for developing countries that are, all new, that are new to this game, very interesting levels of rationalization we've taken for granted about power, about the governance of innovation, about how bureaucracies need to be set up. And there's nowhere that you, well, it's not true that you can't buy a book to learn about this. There are a few now, but this is all fairly new stuff. And again, not something that you'll find in TRIPS. This is a slightly more controversial point. There are multinational companies that are telling the Europeans and the American government and the Japanese government what they need. And we've assumed, rightly or wrongly, I'm just asking the question, that the interests of those companies and those of the countries that are fighting for them internationally are coextensive. Perhaps to a degree they are. I actually think they are to a large degree, but I don't think they overlap 100%. And I think that overlap actually is decreasing, not increasing. 
We've also assumed that because the headquarters of those companies are in the United States and Europe and Japan, that the value chain in producing knowledge goods, informational goods, is going to keep the expertise, the high level of expertise and technical knowledge near the geographic center. The Coca-Cola recipe will always be in the safe in Atlanta. You know, that kind of thinking. Again, is this a valid assumption going forward and for which companies? And let me just uh, make the case that it may not be uh, true in, in all respects. Outsourcing, and this is not going to be a Lou Dobbs analysis of outsourcing, I promise, but um, outsourcing is something that actually moves up a vertical axis. You start with fairly basic functions, basic manufacturing of fairly simple goods, but then these companies that you outsource to uh, are able to do some process creativity. They actually change the process a little bit and make it better. And over the years, what, and China's a very good example of this, they actually become globally competitive in the field that was outsourced to them. There's dozens of books about this. A country starts by imitating, then it adapts, and then, if it's lucky, it gets to globally innovative capacity. This is happening. Not in every country, obviously, but a certain number of developing countries that have played this game very, very well. It's real. Uh, innovation, uh, uh, sorry, employment in, in research and development is, has been up about 2% a year in North America in the last few years, 20% in both China and India. Actually, there's a shortage of scientists in the West in a number of fields. And so we have been recruiting in the West scientists that come out of universities in China and India. Are they going to go back? More importantly, what is the driver here? When you ask companies, and I'll, I'll provide some evidence of that in a second, what is your driver here? They say the cost. Well, the cost of these mines that you're bringing to the United States would actually be lower overseas. And in fact, R&D jobs are moving out of the West. China is currently the second largest R&D player in the world, actually first in one or two areas. We'll also be number two in terms of, of, of GDP uh, in, say, 2020, 2025. India, for example, was voted um, by, I believe, Bain Consulting a few years ago, most innovative in software uh, in a number of areas. So will this coextension assumption hold going forward? I just think it's worth asking the question. Let me give you, I'm not the only one saying this. Business Week. U.S. multinationals have been decoupling from the U.S. economy in the past decade. They still have their headquarters here, but their expansion has been mostly overseas. Europeans say the same thing. This is perhaps the most incredible chart that uh, I've, I've come across recently. This was just published in the New York Times. Since 2002, the high-tech trade balance of the United States has actually turned negative. We're up to about $60 billion now uh, in 07. And so I decided to dig a little deeper here. And actually, I had a, oh, a slide that seems to have disappeared. Uh, but essentially, if you look at the various industries, copyright is wonderful. Copyright exports, $110 billion. Imports, not, no, not, not nothing. There's still a bit of British music out there. But, you know, not huge, not huge. Uh, so copyright, a huge net positive. But if you look at life sciences, significant negative. Um, and I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying it, it says that it means the U.S. should change its foreign IP policy when it comes to pharmaceuticals. But what, how does that mesh with the domestic innovation and, and domestic uh, job creation and so on? I think these are just questions that we, should, we shouldn't avoid. We should find convincing answers one way or the other to these questions. Interestingly, the U.S. position, but also um, uh, well, let's, let's just focus on the U.S. for now. The U.S. P position has shifted a little bit over the last few years. Um, and what are the recent efforts, both domestically and internationally? Piracy. The focus has really been piracy. TRIPS plus the ACTA, which is Japanese, American, European proposal for a new treaty in, of, on anti-counterfeiting, pro-IP that was just passed. And if you look at that, these are not developmental instruments, at least not directly. They may indirectly get there, but these are really about what maybe some people thought TRIPS was about in the first place, but we, that's, that wasn't the story at the time. The story was this will eventually be good, 
uh, for developing local innovation. Here we're back to a very simple focus, stop piracy, protect property. Um, and this is driven, not surprisingly, by copyright industries mostly. Why? Well, because there's much less outsourcing in those industries and there's a lot less local adaptation. You get the Hollywood movie and you watch it. You don't produce a different version for each country as you would for certain types of other products. And so this bill that Pro-IP was just passed is a good uh, domestic illustration of this. Now there's a quote in here I couldn't resist putting on the board. So Rick Cotton, general counsel of NBC Universal, said the bill would give movie and music makers more tools to fight what he called a tidal wave of counterfeiting, counterfeiting and piracy uh, of everything from medical devices to automobile parts. So Hollywood is diversifying. Um, <laughs> but seriously, Rick was most likely misquoted here. But let's just say, let's just say this. If it's about piracy, fine, we all agree. Professional pirates, absolutely. Organized crime, get them out of business. No one ever will, I think, defend the rights of these industries to exist. But let's also recognize this was not what TRIPS was about. At least officially that was not the story back in the 19, early 1990s. Has there been a change in priorities and is the US's role and maybe to a certain extent also the European uh, role changing? Let me just skip those two slides here. Uh, just show you a few things I found in the press the last couple of weeks about US companies actually worrying about not piracy, that's not the story here. The story is I'm worrying, I'm worried about innovation moving to those countries. So how you reconcile that with the shift of priority. NASA is worried about China. The intelligence uh, report that came out a few weeks ago says reduced dominance for the United States and inability to drive the agenda. Actually, the WIPO uh, report is perhaps the most directly relevant. It looks at patents issued in 2005, 2006, and there are three countries that dominate. U.S. is one of them, you'll be glad to know. But China and Korea are actually also driving this, and perhaps more, uh, certainly in terms of percentage-wise, they're driving the growth a lot more. So you, have, you see, you have trips that says initially this is about driving innovation. Um, and outsourcing uh, abilities and so on. Now we're moving back to piracy in terms of negotiations, but maybe this innovation uh, potential is out um, and uh, cannot be put back in the bottle. The CEO of, America, of, of um, Advanced Micro Devices said last March, the US actually must compete for R&D with tax incentives, tax breaks, and said in the same interview, I know of many companies that are leaving their headquarters here, but they're moving their IP to a tax haven as a, as a holding company. Wow. Let me then move to some I th of the harder questions, the deeper questions that are raised by what's happening. We've assumed for the longest time that innovation thrives in a capitalistic society. That's probably true. But we've also assumed, and it's so interesting to have this question now, that capitalism actually means democracy, if you want innovation to happen. And what the argument is now is, mm, no. Democracy, my friends, is only one political instantiation of a capitalistic economy. We have another one, uh, Robert Reich in his book, Super Capitalism, that came out a few months ago, calls it authoritarian capitalism, talking about China. And he says, you know what? it seems to be working better. What does that say about innovation? My question though is, okay, it's working better now. Is it sustainable? Chomsky, whom uh, you probably know, who wrote about everything, including linguistics, uh, but Chomsky I, I, is a, a powerful thinker and he said the state has a duty to help people create and innovate. That's how countries grow and that's how peoples grow. Okay, fine, but can you actually grow as a country and give people this right to create and innovate without giving them, giving them political rights? Can you be asked by the state to create and not have free speech? We always thought the answer to this was no, but China says, mm -mm, not quite. Can you do this and not give people individual property rights? And you'll, of course, guess what's happening in these discussions. Uh, and I've had many discussions with, with friends and colleagues in China. And they say, well, by the way, don't you have a few problems on Wall Street? 
is your style of capitalism really the best? So of course that provides kind of a more dramatic backdrop for these discussions. We'll, we'll see if that's permanent or temporary. But it certainly leads to a re-examination, at least in, by scholars in countries like China, but not just China, of the linkages between the market and the state. And um, I would say more broadly in a triangle between technology, market, and, and the state. Let me just give you, if you needed two more, two reasons why the U.S. should worry, and the Europeans as well, but I'm focusing on the U.S. tonight. The latest theories about innovation say that people innovate generally incrementally. And if you look at PTO patent applications, you know, we went from four blades to five blades on, you know, razors. So incremental. And the next one is six, let me tell you right away. That's not obvious. That's not obvious. Okay. Uh, so we've moved, we've moved, we move incrementally. 99.9% .9 of patents that are filed in not just the U.S., everywhere in the world, incremental. But historically, you have strange leaps, things that change the way an industry does business. Maybe it's one in 10,000 patents. Maybe it's one in 100,000. And then the question is, what makes those leaps happen? Well, According to psychologists who've been working on this, they say it happens in one of two ways. When you think of asking a question no, one, no one's ever asked, or obviously when you find an answer to a question everybody's asking. Like now, everybody's asking, how do you make a hybrid car go more than 20 miles on electric power? But strange leaps happen when people join ideas that were never joined before, that were considered unrelated, that no one ever thought of bringing together. And arguably, if a foreign country is adapting Western technology, they have this whole body of knowledge that we don't necessarily have here. They can bring the two together. They can rethink the role of the state in innovation. They don't have constraints about because they're starting fresh. And again, I think that gives them an advantage. Who makes policy? In those countries, very often it's state-driven policy. Here, as Robert Reich said, we assume that in terms of innovation, the companies that have driven the agenda are making adequate choices. For whom? As I said, we have at least to question whether the choices that they're suggesting are the choices that are good for Europeans, for Americans, and others, and the, the countries where those companies are headquarters. And what role remains for citizens? Uh, I think that's a relevant question. And you can see this tension emerging in the role that NGOs are trying to play in making international IP policy. So let me just offer a few thoughts in closing. Uh, and again, I realize this is not necessarily uncontroversial, but what does the U.S. do in this new environment? Well, clearly innovation policy is something that needs to be at the top of the agenda. This game is being played now. Um, and a fresh look at what's in the national interest. Maybe it's exactly the same as 15, 20 years ago. Maybe it's not. But what's different is competing for innovation with other countries. Before we had to compete with Europeans and, you know, maybe a couple, but now we have to compete with new players who are entering that level of becoming globally competitive, at least in certain industries. The U.S. has taken the attitude uh, fairly uh, in the recent years to uh, forum shifting away from these some, some of these new issues and the work that, you know, not, not playing, but not playing in a fully engaged way. And I wonder if there's a risk here of uh, not fully engaging multilaterally, of playing a bilateral uh, game successfully, but, you know, perhaps uh, not playing as, as aggressively the multilateral game. This assumes that the U.S. can continue to be kind of an exceptionalist player in IP, a uh, unilateral type player in IP. Maybe they can, but I think it's worth asking, uh, can they really uh, do that uh, going forward? And here I can't resist. Presidential politics, uh, I can't resist this. Um, this is just a personal thought, but I read the policy proposals for innovation from the two candidates, and one of them actually proposes, and it doesn't matter who it is, but it matters, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of them has said, I will give three, I think it's $300 million to the person who, the, the company that brings car batteries to the next level. I'm simplifying, but that's the gist of one of the proposals. I'm afraid that historically this has not worked so well. Uh, first of all, it doesn't provide ex ante financing to create the thing in the first place, but imagine you hold the patent on the next generation hybrid cars. 
$300 million is going to pay the peanuts at the party. You're going to have billions with this, right? So again, you kind of wonder, and more importantly, interestingly, you have to ask, what's the government's role here? I, this, uh, the same way that things have changed in the way the market, the, the, the financial markets are regulated, is it the government who should decide that what we need is a new form of electric and energy storage in batteries for uh, the, the car industry? Wow, since when is that the kind of thing the government should decide? And so the other proposal by the other candidate is, is a slightly more uh, open proposal to say, I'm going to give tax breaks, give immigration, very interesting immigration proposal, because we need these workers to come and work in R&D in this country, et cetera, et cetera. But at least that illustrates that even at that level of presidential politics, you have a very clear concern for the future of innovation in the United States. A few more things. Negotiations on IP. One thing that has changed and will not go back is you will no, not have an agreement that just says pure more IP, a pure more IP agreement. Uh, I'd be very surprised. Developing countries are adamant that you need to have something broader than just pure IP. One interesting proposal I read is have an agreement on stronger enforcement, which was probably required because TRIPS has many, many holes in the enforcement section. But how about giving us something on disclosure of resources or giving us something on the three-step test or you know, this kind of balance? It's very interesting to read in the last, in the G8 a meeting which met with the O5. I don't know if you know this acronym, it's a new one. It's uh, the Outreach 5, Brazil, China, India, Mexico, South Africa. That when they met in Germany, very interesting to read what the innovation part, first of all, it's interesting that innovation was on the agenda. But it's interesting to see that the two objectives I've just described are actually in this agenda, in this process. The G8 countries will share their know-how. They will transfer technology. But at the same time, we need an agreement to have better protection for IP. That, I think, is the future format for IP negotiations. Now, developing countries, there are many of them. They're very different. So I'm only really talking about, first of all, those that are above the minimal threshold about which, above which IP may work. Those countries, especially the large ones, want to be major players. They absolutely want to be major players in IP policy. Uh, they need, and they know that this now, that they need a coherent innovation policy, not just cookie cutter TRIPS implementation model laws. And we're actually, most of these countries are re-implementing TRIPS uh, as we speak. But some of these emerging economies have a slightly broader strategic agenda. They want to reshape IP in the WTO by bringing in these other rights the biodiversity rights, the, the traditional knowledge rights. And again, it's not impossible that the WTO will actually do something about this. So what role does that leave, and these are the last two slides, on for intergovernmental institutions? Well, there are great expectations for the new director general of WIPO. Yeah, the politically incorrect side. But, um, Francis Gurry was just elected as DG of WIPO, and yes, he is portrayed as the savior of that institution, uh, an institution that has had some uh, credibility challenges in the last few years uh, in terms of policy making and intellectual leadership, but never, I must say, never in terms of its ability to register IP rights effectively. That I think you know, a lot of people recognize they do well. So if you're WIPO, what do you do in this environment, this complex new environment where these countries are playing a, a new role? Well, obviously the development agenda, which is kind of you know, the filling the gap between IP and innovation, that's politically crucial. We all know that as a political matter. But you really need to get concrete here and say, how do you actually fill this gap? And WIPO has not done that uh, terribly well up to now. WIPO can get data to test some of the assumptions I was discussing so that at least we can explain them to the developing world. They should drop the losers. These agreements, these proposed treaties that have been on the you know, table for 600 years that are never going to happen. Or develop fresh options. Do something different. Propose something else that will actually uh, get uh, broad support. And WIPO could. They haven't, but they certainly could take the real lead on innovation policy research. This is something that's being done essentially in a number of universities now, not at the multilateral level. If you're the WTO, what do you do? Well, 
You're not going to look for a whole lot of TRIPS amendments because they're not going to happen. 31 bis has been sitting there for years, may or may not enter into force by 2032. Uh, we have a Doha declaration that puts it in, you know, in force indirectly, but that's not the way to go. M you know, major amendments to TRIPS are probably not going to happen. I am a big fan, however, of ministerial declaration. Ministers getting together, adopting a declaration that in WTO law has almost the same power as a, an amendment. They could have a declaration on the so-called flexibilities of TRIPS, at least in some areas, so that you cabin them in a way that is acceptable. Um, and I think some of that is possible. Uh, in, if there's flexibility on that, then maybe there's flexibility on increasing uh, measures against counterfeiting and enforcement. Traditional knowledge, genetic resources, 29 bis is not going to happen, but a ministerial declaration perhaps would. The appellate body will be certainly under the microscope for the next four or five years because now that they've indicated they're prepared to look at IP as part of the broader framework of public international law, well, what does it mean? And here they have two options. The first is to say we're going to embrace these non-WTO rights, bring them into the framework of TRIPS, but then you risk dilution. You risk diluting negotiated agreements, and that's not very WTO-like. Or you reject them, say, well, we said that, but you know, we didn't really mean it. But then you face kind of a loss of relevance, at least with the countries that are uh, very interested in bringing these rights uh, in uh, the context of uh, the WTO or elsewhere. That leaves a one last question, which is, well, what should we do uh, in terms of uh, analytical work or, or otherwise? And I think I'll leave that for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Much, Daniel, Thank you, Peter. Uh, for the, the provocation and much to, to think about and I hope a little to talk about. We have about 15 minutes for, for questions and answers. There are two mics and I would ask you if, if you are interested in asking a question to go to one of the mics and identify yourself and then um, we, will, we will proceed. <coughs> Hi, how are you doing? Thank you very I'm much fine. for the presentation. It was fantastic. Uh, my name is Michael Shmilovich. I'm actually an alum of the WCL currently, a patent attorney at the NIH. Oh, good. Um, and my question to you is actually, I, I wanted you to expand, if you could, on the concept of rent extraction that pharmaceutical companies would have to do to be able to maybe reimburse, um, you know, local and indigenous populations for their uh, cultural knowledge on on drugs, pharmaceuticals, and biologicals. Okay, yeah. uh, excellent question. Thank you. Um, well, the argument from many of the developing countries goes like this. Uh, you are getting uh, the money you need to do your research and development, you, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, by charging the prices you do in the West. And the extra money you'll make in our countries, uh, the developing countries, is not actually worth it. That's a bit of a stretch in some countries, but you know, if you look at countries like Brazil, India, and, and, and China, and so on, they're not actually poor countries. But the argument is, that's the first part of the argument. I, that's not highly credible for at least some emerging economies. What is credible and um, com came out of TRIPS 2.0 analyses was, if you're going to extract rent from developing countries, you should do more research uh, in diseases that are more relevant to us, the developing world, typically tropical diseases, uh, and, of, of course, the pharmaceutical industry says, well, first of all, you share diseases with the West, for, with the you know, North, the West, the, the developed world. Um, and we do some research for diseases that are tropical, but uh, according to one slide that I, 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 I kind of skipped or went over very quickly, uh, I believe it was 21 out of 1,556 over a 20-year period that were new drugs that were approved that were specific to developing countries. So that's where uh, you hear two potential solutions. One is the WHO saying, well, that's normal. That, those are market-driven companies. They have to sell drugs where they can sell them. Um, so let's move to publicly funded uh, research, something you know something about, uh, because then governments can make choices about what they're going to fund, and then it's, it's certainly developing countries can also fund some of this research. 
The second line of argument, and I think that's where you were going, is, well, if you're going to take something out of a developing country to produce a new drug, then what is your obligation to so-called benefit share? Um, and some companies have been voluntarily benefit sharing with uh, indigenous com communities. I think it depends on the number of factors. Uh, if you're only going, to, if you're sending scientists down to this tropical jungle and they, on, on their own, come back with this plant and identify some properties, you know, to what extent does that extraction of genetic resources create an obligation to benefit share? Some people would disagree here about, you know, whether you need to, you need to benefit share. But what if you go to a, a tribe living in that part and say, well, oh, that's an interesting mixture. Oh, yeah, we've been doing this for 200, you know, 1,000 years, or, and we've, we mixed this plant with that plant, and then you come out with a drug that has a far higher chance of success than starting basically from basic research, then most people would say that's a, a situation that definitely requires benefit sharing. Now, how do you do that in... Um, in the WTO, well, as I said, you can amend TRIPS, I would say dream on, or uh, you can have a ministerial declaration that at least puts the principle on the table. I would be favorable to that. Um, and I, I think many countries will actually support that. The Europeans have said they were prepared to accept that in exchange for the famous register on geographical indications at the end of, of uh, in this summer. So um, not quite like that, but very close to that. So there might be movement. Um, then the question now is, is, how do you define it? How do you enforce it? Uh, and, and what is the level of acceptable benefit sharing? And I you know, obviously have no answer to, to that one. Uh, the principle, though, should be, at least in the case where you get the, the advanced medicinal knowledge out of, of, of somebody else, you, you should, you know, get, they should get some recognition. Hi, Joe Rosigliano from Arnold and Porter. I'd like to continue on that, that line just a little bit. I have a question on, and, and I'd like your observations on this. Uh, what you are calling TRIPS 2.0, and that includes Doha, seems to be completely undermining a great deal of the IP in the West, especially the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. India is not, in fact, going after drugs that are just relevant to their market. True. Uh, we've had, what, four compulsory licenses? Sunitinab, Torceva, both anti-cancer drug, and now two HIV and then the patents they deny, too, which and went patents they've denied as mm -hmm. well. So it seems that Western intellectual property is being, how can I put this, uh, tampered with at the governmental level. Yep. And you're, you're seeing a, a governmental pullback from trips, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. In many countries, uh, Archana Chankar, who just gave a, a talk on a webinar series I've been helping to produce for the school, tells me that India is not backing away from trips, but... I think otherwise. Well, India is not backing away from trips, but uh, actually, it's very interesting. If you look at the, w the things India is doing, it's both pulling away from certain aspects of trips and pushing others. And so, a bit like China, actually. Um, what India has done, for example, is to create national law schools that teach IP. So, national law schools in India are really the top tier of law schools. The applicant, the rate of applicant to uh, admissions, about one in seven thousand, I think, or so. But, um, and these, there these, so they have, they recognize the need to create this IP knowledge base in the country. Uh, but, you know, like China and like India, but other, a number of other countries, they've, they've learned a game of paper compliance, and they're helped by the fact that TRIPS is not subject to so-called non-violation complaints, which didn't help the U.S. in the, in the recent China case. Um, and so, they're playing that game by saying, we're going to, de-emphasize trips in areas where we feel it's in our interest to do so and emphasize it in areas that... Now, I would say some countries in the West have done that too, maybe not quite uh, as, as deliberately or, or, or openly, but um, look at the evolution of patent enforcement uh, in the U.S., uh, certainly prior to the Federal Circuit, you know, going from... There were different views about the... And so even today we're hearing these different views. In Europe was the same thing, in Japan was the same thing. Uh, now, the U.S. Has in, the, in the last 20 years has taken a fairly uh, openly pro-IP position internationally. That's no secret. Uh, but these countries point to, you know, well, look at what's going on in the U.S., all these internal debates. So they're helped by the fact that the West seems to be debating internally what IP rules are good or not. You know, 
oh, what's this KSR case? Now, what is this non-obvious debate that you're having? What is genetic non-obviousness, you know, et cetera? They know. They know these things, and they, they're very, very um, aware of what's going on. But as you said yourself, TRIPS 2.0 provided the normative base for uh, bringing human rights into the picture. And that's still there. Uh, and those countries are saying, well, we're not going to apply patents when we feel that it, it violates these, uh, these human rights principles. And we still don't have a clear idea what the WTO will do with that. It may indeed undermine uh, some parts of the agreement if they were to bring in human rights and say, I agree with you, country X, that you don't have to you know, apply TRIPS in this way because you couldn't then comply with this human rights obligation that you have. We haven't heard that from the WTO. But we did hear from the appellate body that they were prepared to look at these human rights agreements when interpreting TRIPS. I don't know what they're going to do. And if they do that, what's the price to pay for the WTO in the future as, as the home of international IP? I know some countries will probably not look on this favorably. A whole cascade of question follows. Uh, it's an interesting question. Thanks, Dan. Yes, Josh. Yeah, I'm Josh Sarnoff at WCL. Um, you hinted at price regulation and maybe to some extent antitrust issues mm -hmm. um, being much more important to the rent extraction debates. And clearly there's going to also be more state involvement. You see it in India in their discussions over their equivalent by Dole Act. I'm wondering yep. what role you see the WTO or WIPO playing in mediating forthcoming disputes over those activities that the states are going to engage in as they start developing very serious policies about not just protecting the property, but actually regulating how it's used, regulating how it's controlled, regulating the prices that can be charged, which limit the extraction of rents, yep. imposing restrictions on government funded activity so that you don't get private rights that can then be exercised through high market price, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, another great question. I think that um, the governments in the developing world that are re-implementing TRIPS based on the kind of discussion that uh, I was trying to illustrate are saying, well, th there are two pillars. One is how do we develop our own innovation, which means what are the priorities? What are the areas in which we actually think we can compete? Uh, and second, how do we limit the costs of IP implementation, the welfare cost, as you rightly mentioned? And then they say, well, let's look at TRIPS. And TRIPS says very little about antitrust. There's 8 and 40, and 8 doesn't say much, and 40 seems fairly limited. Uh, but they say, we're going to interpret TRIPS as saying that because it doesn't say much about competition law, and because all the Western countries that told us that TRIPS would be good, have this kind of law, we're going to have one too. Uh, and so the package now of implementation includes competition legislation uh, and or abuse of right, but um, abuse of right has not, as a doctrine, has not yielded great results in the, any of the developing countries I can think of. It's not something that's, it's more the kind of a judicially developed doctrine that takes time and probably won't produce substantial effects. Uh, for quite a while. Whereas competition law, you create a special enforcement authority that has special powers, uh, and we're used to that, and we know how it works, uh, and it works differently in every country because it's not regulated internationally. So that countries can pretty much, to a certain extent at least, do, uh, do it the way that, that they want uh, within, within certain parameters. This has not been tested either at the WTO. How far can you take competition rules to you know, limit the impact of TRIPS rules? We don't know. Would the panel look at 40 and say, oh, that's it, that's all? Well, then there are a number of Western countries that should look at their competition legislation. Uh, or um, would they take a, a different view here and say, well, this isn't fully regulated in TRIPS, so we're going to let countries do. Um, uh, and there are arguments in the preamble, for example, that would support this view. I'm not the, I don't think it's very likely that the panel would open competition law very broadly. And, and, but, but they might go past uh, 8 and 40. So uh, it's another in interesting development. And I think if we talk about TRIPS in five or 10 years, we will have had at least one case on competition and TRIPS.
Christine. Close the proceedings. This is, so this, if wrong. this is a question, it looks really good. <laughs> well, um, it's uh, my role. I'm Christine Haight Farley. I'm one of the professors here. And it's my role to say this. Um, this uh, annual event has, uh, it's kind of close to Thanksgiving each year. And it really feels like Thanksgiving for us at the program. Um, because we are very grateful. And first, we are very grateful to all of you. Um, you are our old friends, our new friends, uh, but you are our good friends, and I'm so glad that you came tonight. And I hope that if you haven't already, you'll think of this annual event, you'll kind of put a question mark in the month of October, you know, when will this event occur, and you'll come back and it will be kind of a reunion for us all uh, each year, um, because obviously uh, it's been a really exciting series of lectures. Um, I next want to thank uh, Finnegan um, for being such uh, generous and supportive sponsors of the program. Um, and I want to thank in particular uh, Dave Kelly, uh, who's really been a delightful supporter of the program. And what, what to get the IP firm that has everything? Well, we have just a little something uh, that we would like to present you. And it's heavy. <laughs> and breakable. <laughs> Not the pants, huh? <coughs> Thank you very much. Um. <laughs> and finally, um, I want to thank our, our tremendous, uh, distinguished lecturer tonight. Um, this has been just a very exciting, informative, provocative, accurate. Um, will keep me up at night, actually, worrying about some of the things that were presented tonight. Um, and this has been a, a tremendous um, addition to our lecture series, uh, a pan-IP uh, lecture uh, with international dimensions, for sure. And I'm very grateful, and we have something to present to you as well. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>